Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at Shakespeare's Henry V, which is the climax of Shakespeare's second Henry Tetralogy, a series of history plays about the lives of Richard II, Henry IV, and Henry V. Now, we've been building up to this play over the past three plays, in which we saw the overthrow of Richard II, the rise of Henry IV, the struggle of Henry IV against a nation torn apart by indecision, the struggles of Henry IV to establish himself in security in his state, as well as the growth and maturity of his son, Prince Hal, who is now finally king after rejecting Falstaff in the last play. And this was the play that Shakespeare's audience had been waiting for for a very long time. Henry V was the great hero king of their history. And Shakespeare's treatment of him as Prince Hal was very entertaining and a lot of fun. But finally seeing him reach his maturity, the height of his career, and do the heroic battle of Agincourt, which is where he really shines, was definitely something that the audience was excited about. And Shakespeare treats this play as an epic. He opens with a chorus who invokes a muse. Oh, for a muse of fire. And if you've ever studied epic poetry like the Iliad or the Odyssey, you know that epics are all about larger-than-life heroism. But Shakespeare doesn't forget all the ruffians in this play either. All of Prince Hal's old friends show up again, with the exception of Falstaff, who dies off stage of a broken heart or a fever. Shakespeare promised to include him in this play, but couldn't find a place for him, and so he edited him out. We still get to see some of the other characters like Pistol, Bardolph, and Nim, but we also watch them slowly deteriorate as Prince Hal has turned into Henry V and left them behind, and as Falstaff is no longer there to hold everything together. Prince Hal, now Henry V, is ready to do some heroic action, it's true, but he also has the weight of the past on him which we see very clearly in his response to his old friends. There's a particularly poignant scene in which Bardolph is hanged, for instance, and also in his recognition of his position as the son of a father who may or may not have usurped the throne. Is this throne his moral right? That was a question that's been asked all throughout this entire tetralogy. There are so many great things in this play, and I would like to treat it in a much longer fashion. But for today, we're just going to give you a quick summary. As I mentioned before, the play is punctuated by a chorus figure who stands up and recalls the sort of epic voice. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. It's interesting the tension created by the very first minute of the play. The chorus who speaks in this epic voice, invoking a muse, the sort of thing we'd expect of the beginning of the Iliad or the Odyssey or the Aeneid, then moves into an apology that we don't have true princes to battle across the stage, that we don't have horses to charge into battle here. Instead, all of the action is truly going to be in the imagination of the audience. And so this becomes an apology for the play, much like some of the epilogues or prologues that we see in other plays. So the play truly opens in Act 1, Scene 1, with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Eli, who are having a conversation about Henry V. And as sometimes happens in Shakespeare's plays, especially as history plays, we get a couple of characters who fill us in on some key details on how things are going in scene one, so we get a perspective. We hear about Prince Hal's transformation into Henry V from the young prince who seemed like he was up to no good and would never amount to anything into this rather impressive young king. We also see that he deeply cares about the church, and it seems like part of that stems from his desire to make things right with God, since he's not certain his father's rise to the throne was completely moral. 
In any case, these two church leaders are going to use it to their greatest advantage. If they can direct his attention outward to France, rather than towards themselves, they will be much better taken care of. And their motives seem to align well with the sort of things that Henry IV taught Henry V on his deathbed. He told Henry to direct action out of the country to keep people from questioning his position as king. In any case, there is a dispute over an area of France which should belong to Henry, thanks to the actions of Edward III back a few generations. Now, there are going to be lots of references to the play Edward III, which is a play that Shakespeare had at least a hand in writing. It's often not included in the canon of his plays, but scholars are fairly certain that he at least wrote parts of it. And he was at least definitely very familiar with it, because there are many references to the action of that play in this play. And so the priests go before Henry V and make this claim. You own this part of France, you have a claim to it. And Henry had already sent this claim to the King of France. And it seems as though the King was not very interested in recognizing Henry's sovereignty over that area. In fact, when the ambassador from France comes in, he comes not from the king himself, but from the Dauphin, the French prince, who sends Henry a ton of treasure, which turns out to be tennis balls, recognizing that he thinks Henry is more of a partier and a gamer than actually a warlike leader. This riles Henry up, and he sends back a rather impressive defiance. We move to Act Two, in which the chorus introduces that there is a plot against Henry V. France has paid off some of his close friends to assassinate him. But before we see what comes to that, we cut to some of Henry's old friends, the band that used to hang around with Falstaff. Bardolf, who is a notorious drinker, as most of them are, but who also is known for having ridiculous acne is trying to be a peacemaker between Nim and Pistol, because Pistol swooped in and married the girl that Nim planned on marrying. I say girl, but it's actually Mistress Quickly, who is one of the main characters running through the Tetralogy. And although they're about to come to blows, Bardolf manages to part them. At that point, the young boy shows up, who is the squire to Falstaff to let them know that Falstaff is on his deathbed, so they all hurry to see him one more time. In scene two, we find that Henry has found out about the plot against his life, and so he calls forward the three conspirators, Lord Scrope, the Earl of Cambridge, and Sir Thomas Grey. And after leading them in to plead for a harsher sentence for a man who railed against the king, he hands them each a schedule of his orders for them, which reveals to each of them that he knows about their treachery. They plead for mercy, but he leads them to execution, but not without an impassioned speech to each of them. This scene allows us to see Henry as somebody who is incredibly wise in response to a threat against his life. He responds with justice as well as mercy. He can't let these men live, because they represent a threat to the throne and to the whole kingdom. They sold out to France. But his impassioned speech to them also turns all of their hearts. And so they repent, not in order to receive a reprieve of the punishment, but rather because they want his forgiveness as they go to execution, which he gives to them. Meanwhile, back in East Cheap, we see Henry's old friends again, and we find out that Falstaff has died. And we have this rather poignant description from Hostess Quickly, who always scrambles up her words, and yet somehow manages to make Falstaff's death sound poetic, and there is a poignancy to the entire scene, a rather touching poignancy. It's also coupled by the fact that they're all saying goodbye as they head off to the wars. In scene four, we cut to the King of France, who is speaking with the Dauphin. The Dauphin is incredibly haughty and does not believe anything will come from England. When the Duke of Exeter arrives from England to tell them how Henry has hurled a defiance in their faces, especially in the face of the Dauphin. The king is rather hesitant about all of this, but the Dauphin simply laughs it off. The chorus arrives again to move the action into France as Henry sails across the sea and begins to lay siege to the town of Harfleur. Scene one, Henry is charging once more into the breach, but we quickly cut to Nim, Bardolf, Pistol, and the boy, 
who are avoiding the action as much as possible until Captain Fluellen shows up to drive them forward. Fluellen is a delightful new humorous character, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. And the scene ends with the boy speaking about how he is boy to all three of these characters, Bardolph, Nim, and Pistol. And yet all of them are villains and don't give him anything to aspire to. In Act 3, Scene 3, we see several of the captains gathered together with different opinions on how to do the siege. A big part of the fun of this is that they come from different places. We have Fluellen, the Welshman, Jamie, the Scot, and McMorris, the Irishman, and Gower, who's just kind of an idiot. Fluellen is one of the most fun characters and gets a lot of attention throughout the rest of the play. He's the Welshman with great ideas, academic ideas, on how battle should work, and he's always interested in talking to people about the battle. He's a little bit ridiculous and a little bit goofy, but he's also charmingly loyal and dutiful to the king. A lot of the fun comes from them arguing back and forth with all of their accents. Ultimately, the scene ends as Henry comes to the gates and calls out to the governor of the town, demanding their surrender. And the governor says, you know, we're not getting any support from France, we'll go ahead and open the gates, you have the city. Henry's threats against them are pretty dire. He says, let us in now while I still have control of my men. If you wait too long, their bloodlust may run too high, and then I won't be able to control them when we finally do sack your city. And so the governor opens the gates to them. In scene four, we cut to Princess Catherine, who is the French princess. And this scene is entirely in French, but Catherine is trying to get a language lesson from her nurse, Alice. It appears that she knows that she's going to need to start speaking English rather soon. And there's also lots of wordplay with the way certain English words sound in French. In scene five, we cut back to the King of France, who sees that things are a little bit worse than they expected. Henry is really tearing up their country. The Dauphin is scoffing against the English victories, but they also see an opening now. Now's their chance to surround and attack the English army after it's already worn out from it, the Siege of Harfleur, and while it's on the march. In scene six, we cut back to Fluellen and Gower, who are interrupted in a conversation by Pistol, who is begging for the life of Bardolf. Bardolf stole from a church, and now he is to be hanged, and Pistol is begging for Bardolf's life. Once Fluellen understands the situation, he's no longer interested in hearing what Pistol has to say. Bardolf had it coming. All of these cut purses and thieves will pay if they steal, and all Pistol can do is curse and walk away. Henry comes in and asks about their losses, and finds out that they've done very well, but he does also hear about the hanging of Bardolf, and he responds in a fairly cold way. We would have all such offenders so cut off, and we here give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language, for when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. So he just lays out the law, no, no stealing, no bothering the French people, we're doing our job, and we aren't pillaging like that. But this was his old friend and close associate that he's just had killed. And so there's a lot of emotion that could be expressed in that moment, and has been through several productions of this play. Now arrives Montjoy the Herald. The French army is about to surround and engage them, and they are weary and outnumbered. The French army was just waiting until their wrongs against France had reached a certain point, and now they're really going to feel their wrath and Henry should probably go ahead and ransom himself before he's killed. Henry responds and says, yeah, this isn't the greatest time for us to fight, but you know what? I'm not surrendering myself. He says, we would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are. We say we will not shun it. So tell your master. And although the English army is not looking forward to a fight right now, they're tired, they're weary, and they're greatly outnumbered. Henry continually puts the power in God's hands. And so both armies camp for the night, preparing to engage in the morning. The next two scenes explore the camps at night. The first shows the Dauphin bragging about his horse in the 
absolute most extreme and hyperbolic ways, to the irritation of everyone around him. But the French are in good spirits, thinking about how many English they're going to kill in the morning. Act 4 opens with another chorus, who talks about the way the English are feeling. They're not feeling very spirited tonight. And so in scene one, we see Henry walking among the men in disguise. He talks briefly with Pistol, and then with Bates and Williams. And he debates with the common soldiers whether the king is responsible for the men's deaths in this moment. At first, the soldiers say, well, the king brought us here, and so he's got a lot to answer for come Judgment Day. Which is a lot of weight on Henry's shoulders. We're going to see it more in just a moment. But Henry then responds and says, well, you know, aren't... Isn't each person individually responsible for their own actions? Isn't the weight of their own sins on their shoulders? And the men more or less agree with the king on that. But the men also think, well, the king can always just ransom himself off and the rest of us go to slaughter. But Henry swears to them that he knows the king will never ransom himself. Of course, they don't know that he is the king, and so what's it to them? And so he picks a fight with Williams without Williams knowing that he's the king over this point. And so Williams gives him one of his gloves and says, wear this in your hat after the battle if you survive, and when I see you again in the daytime after the battle, we'll have a fight over this. And so Henry agrees. And so finally Henry is alone, and at that point he pours out in this soliloquy the weight of all of this. He feels the weight of responsibility for all of these soldiers who are about to go into this battle where they're hopelessly outnumbered. And in this moment he's praying and pouring out his heart to God and saying, God, please don't send judgment on me now for the failings of my father. And we see the weight of everything on him as he is trying to deal with this moment. It's a rather intense and vivid moment. The weight of all of the plays is resting on his shoulders. Act 4, Scene 2 sees the Fritsch camp waking up, getting ready for battle, being very cheered and excited. Act 4, Scene 3 sees the English camp, and they are looking pretty glum. They're eyeing the French numbers and looking at their own camp and seeing how very, very outnumbered they are. And that number, Warwick says, Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. Because today happens to be a holiday, a saint's day. Saint Crispin Crispian's day, which is sort of two saints combined. In any case, King Henry has just stepped on and he overhears Warwick saying that. And he has his most famous speech, the St. Crispin's Day speech, which is this inspirational speech. And it's got some fantastic lines in it. It's where we get the line, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. But the general point of the inspirational speech is simply that, you know what, the fewer people we have, the more honor we have as we fight. And by the end, even Warwick is so charged up that he says, you know what, I wish it were just me and you doing all the fighting. Montjoy arrives one more time to ask if King Henry will ransom himself, but he says, no, we're going into this battle. The next several scenes are battle. One is Pistol, who is taking a prisoner, and uh, he's not able to speak French, and the prisoner's not able to speak English, and so the boy translates for them. And of course, Pistol's just in it for the ransom that he can get, the money that he can get. And so, at the end of this scene, the boy says, you know what, I'm sick of working for these guys. I'm gonna go ahead and go hang out with the lackeys at the luggage. We also cut to the French lords, who are doing very poorly. The battle is going very much against them. And so they're trying to rally themselves and return to battle, but the English are fighting ferociously. Henry and Exeter meet up on the battlefield, and Exeter tells about the tragic death of the Duke of York and the Earl of Suffolk. At this point, Henry finds out about the desperate counterattack of the French, and so he orders the prisoners to be killed in the moment of urgency. We find that the French have snuck around and slaughtered all the boys who were watching the luggage, much to Flewellyn's dismay, breaking all the rules of war. Flewellyn and Gower talk for a while about how bravely Henry has shown himself. Flewellyn is speaking in glowing terms about Henry and all of Henry's history, and he's using these rather ridiculous comparisons to Alexander the Great. Henry comes in furious over the death of the boys. But just as he's responding to this, in comes Montjoy. Henry yells at him, thinking he's coming one more time for ransom, but Montjoy is actually asking that there be a ceasefire, and that they be allowed to remove the bodies on the field. 
Henry replies and says, I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no, for yet a many of your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field. And Montjoy says, the day is yours. The English have won the battle. Praised be God and not our strength for it. Henry replies. And then, finding that the name of the castle nearby is Agincourt, he calls it the Field of Agincourt. Now, historically, what actually happened here is worth noting. The French army did massively outnumber the English army, but the field was wide in one place and narrow in another. And so the French army was bottlenecked in, and the English managed to hold them there and ultimately do so much damage that they won the fight, in spite of being outnumbered five to one. After the fight is over, Henry and Flewellen have a conversation, and Flewellen reminds him of the historical Edward the Black Prince of Wales. Again, a reference back to the play Edward III and talks about their Welsh kinship. At this point, Williams comes in with the glove in his cap, and after Henry prods him for a moment to find out what the, the glove is all about, already knowing, of course, he then asks Flewellen to wear the counter glove in his cap, saying that he took the glove from a traitor, and if anyone come and challenge it, that man is a traitor, and to bring him straight. Henry then tells Warwick and Gloucester to quickly go after Flewellen because he's about to be attacked and to make sure no bloodshed happens. When Williams challenges Flewellen, Flewellen has him arrested and dragged before the king. But when the king admits that no, it was actually I who you challenged, Williams still stands up for himself, saying, Your majesty came not like yourself. You appeared to me but as a common man. Witness the night, your garments, your lowliness, and what your highness suffered under that shape, I beseech you take it for your own fault and not mine. For had you been as I took you, I made no offense. Therefore, I beseech your highness, pardon me." So Williams is the kind of person who stands by his word and continues to hold fast to what he said, no matter what, even to the king's face. He said, hey, if I knew you were the king, I wouldn't have said it, but I didn't. You came as a normal, common person, so I didn't do anything wrong. And so Henry repays him by filling the glove full of crowns and giving it to him. And Flewellen chips in on the goodwill and gives him a little bit for his shoes, too. And at this point, we find out how great the victory was, because we see all the great French lords who died in battle, and yet we find that there were no real huge casualties on the English side. And again, Henry says that the praise only goes to God and not to themselves. Act 5, the chorus comes in to talk about how things have gone since that battle, and now we are moving to a time of treaty between France and England. Before we do that, though, in Act 5, Scene 1, we see Flewellen wearing a leek in his cap, which is a Welsh tradition on a special Welsh holiday. But the Welsh holiday was the day before, and now he is angry because Pistol made fun of him on that day. And so he is wearing the leek so that if Pistol challenges it again, he's going to force Pistol to eat the leek. And so he does. He beats Pistol about the pate and forces him to eat his leek. And Pistol, who is all fire in his words, but not so much in his actions, is completely cowed by Flewellen. And although Pistol complains and complains, he can't do anything about it. And we find out afterwards also that not only did Bardolph get hanged for stealing, but Nim did as well. And we find out back home that Pistol's wife has died of a venereal disease. And so Pistol is now the last survivor of Henry's old friends. And he's going to sport these scars of his broken pate and say that he got them in the war. In Act 5, Scene 2, Henry is going before the King of France, and they're talking about the treaty and the demands made by England. And the King is still hesitant on a few of them, and so they're going to go over them one more time. While they make the final negotiations, Henry stays outside to speak with Catherine, who is one of his primary demands along with ruling over almost the whole of France. And so for a good portion of the rest of this scene, Henry and Catherine have a really terrible flirtation. Henry is really bad at charming the ladies, but it hardly matters because Catherine speaks very little English. And the translation back and forth with Alice is pretty weak. However, it's also fairly clear that Catherine is willing to give it a go, in spite of the fact that they can't communicate and that their manners are very different. In the end, King Charles comes out and says that he has surrendered to all of King Henry's demands. 
And so we end with a marriage coming up between Henry and Catherine. And so we have the final epilogue, which reminds us that the next part of the story has already been played many, many times by Shakespeare and his troupe, because the next four plays were written early in Shakespeare's career. Henry VI, part one, two, three, and of course, Richard III. It's a fascinating, dramatic, and exciting story in which Henry deals with the pressures all around of his past, his friendship with Falstaff and his former friends, and the fact that he has already given them up, but also the past of his father and the morality of holding on to the throne here. Can he become a strong hero king who holds the country together? We already also know that this is only going to last during his reign, which is pretty short. And everything is going to fall apart during the reign of the next king, which we see in the Henry VI plays. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.